Today we've got questions on the Holy Roman Emperor, church property, diplomacy, and Charles gives us his thoughts on whether serfs were like slaves. Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu, now being broadcast and podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with an indigenous Charles Coulomb. Indigenous? Indigenous. You mean like a Native American or an American Indian, as we normally say. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And is that because I have Huron and Algonquin blood or because I'm currently in Oklahoma? Currently in Oklahoma. Way down yonder in the Indian Nation? Yes. Cowboy's life is his occupation? In the <laughs> Oklahoma Hills where I was born? Is, is that what you're talking about? Well, what, what is that from? That's from a Woody Guthrie song. Oh. Because I See, I'm here in Oklahoma right now, at Clear Creek Abbey, and the spirits of Woody Guthrie and uh, Will Rogers are guiding me. That, that's beautiful. I'm, I'm, I've got sort of a weird combination of Indian casino and dust bowl going on in my head. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Superimposed on that, however, is a Benedictine abbey of the uh, darkest and most traditional dye. Two-hour-long mass, uh, conventional mass, with all sorts of processions and whatnot. Uh, 60 monks, or 50, a lot of them anyway, tons of them, and uh, a ton of uh, lay people, many young families in the congregation. I was here to uh, uh, give a talk on Empress Zita at the Empress Zita Symposium, because Clear Creek Abbey is also the headquarters of the American cause for the beatification of Empress Zita, uh, reason being that her main cause is headquartered in Solaim, the great Benedictine Abbey of Dom Garanger in France. So, it's, you know, it's all good. How did that happen? That's kind of uh, interesting. Well, uh, you may remember that back in October, I was at the uh, Kaiser Karl Convention in Dallas. And the lady, uh, Diane Schwind, who runs the American uh, cause for Zeta, asked me if I would mind coming here for this weekend. And you know me, I mean, if you'll... Send me a ticket. I'll, I, I really don't care. I'll go. But beyond that, of course, I, I've got a great belief in the uh, in the cause. Number one, uh, and number two, uh, it was a chance to see Clear Creek Abbey, of which I've heard so much, and to come back to beautiful Oklahoma. Wow, that's awesome. This it is, and this is the second most sacred spot in all of Oklahoma that I've ever been to. What's the f most sacred? You know, you, you sound you sound vaguely dissatisfied. Because you're hammering it home because it's an old joke. It's an old, stale uh, joke we just did on the pre-show. But go ahead. Oh, Tell so you're thinking, you're thinking that the general audience should be deprived of, a, of this gem. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Yeah, they should have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not going to, because I'm that kind of guy. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard it first. I have been to the most sacred spot in all of Oklahoma, and that spot is the Will Rogers Memorial. Sacred to the memory of the great uh, entertainer. And it is a huge, sprawling edifice. But see, if you're not willing to come out here yourself, Vinny, you... To take your wife to Santa Monica, to Will Rogers State Park, and enjoy his mansion, and also watch Polo. All right. See, you have no idea how much uh, entertainment value the area that you live in all really offers. You don't, you don't appreciate fair. it. Uh, well, it, no, I don't. No, I don't. You don't. I mean, you've never been to the end of the seventh ray. Oh, are we going back to there? 
We, we can't go back. You've never been. <laughs> you seem very confused. But, you know, the thing about Topanga, I'll tell you a quick story about Topanga Canyon. Okay. It was, don't be shocked, one of the centers of the counterculture when I was a boy. And still is in a lot of ways. As is the town of Ojai, California, near Thomas Aquinas College. One day, about maybe even 20 years ago now, I was in the late lamented Derby on uh, Los Feliz uh, Boulevard in L.A., and I was chatting with my waitress, and I asked her, oh, where are you from? And she looked at me with utter annoyance and disgust, and she said, where am I from, sir? Where am I from? I'll tell you where I'm from. I was born in Topanga. I said, oh, yes, of course, at home. Natural, Lamaz. And when I was eight years old, my parents moved me to Ojai. Do you understand, sir? Are you getting a picture? I said, yeah, I'm getting a picture. And she said, do you know what my name is, sir? I said, no, I don't know. She said, Jet. Do you know why my parents named me Jet? I have no idea. It's because as my mother was giving birth to me, my father in attendance, Lamaz, one passed overhead. They took it as a sign an omen. So they named me after it. You understand, sir? I said, I'm beginning to. She said, I really love my boyfriend, but I will never marry him. I said, why is that? She said, his last name is Black. I'm not doing that. True story. Exactly as I've told it. She was really grumpy. Well, she was, and I think she felt a certain amount of resentment toward my generation. How old was she? A lot younger than me. Well, I, I figure she's very young, but you know, sometimes people like chill out and mellow out. You know, well, she wasn't, she wasn't chill about the counterculture, but you should take your own advice and chill out about the age of Aquarius. What happens to the... So what do, you, what, do, what do you think that means in terms of her political beliefs and her worldview? Where, where, where do you go in a secular fashion from that? Well, that's a good question, because uh, you're reacting against the 60s. Yeah. So you're probably not going to go toward what we would call the left, uh, which is so dominated by people of my vintage. Uh, you might go toward the secular right. So you might go libertarian. Uh, you might go crypto fascist. You, you might go anything that basically thumbs its nose at Topeka and Ojai in the 60s. <laughs> Crypto fascist? Is that like Bitcoin? It's very like Bitcoin. <laughs> in, fact, it's, it, it, in fact, in fact, I've heard rumors that anyone who has anything to do with Bitcoin is probably a fascist. Or a malcontent of some kind. Who doesn't love the U.S. dollar? <laughs> That's such a weird statement. Who doesn't love the U.S. dollar? That's okay. right. And well, anybody who's in favor of Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency obviously hates the U.S. dollar and probably doesn't like mom or apple pie either. Fun fact, actually, you know, Eric Sammons, the the father of or the the da the dad of uh, Catholic Twitter, quote unquote. My uh, my editor at Crisis Magazine. He he literally wrote a book on Bitcoin. He's interested in Bitcoin, so that's See? that's interesting Cri to me. Crypto fascist, obviously. Same with <laughs> Crisis and all its writers. I mean, uh, I bet uh, I I bet. Uh, 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 how about those Yankees? Huh? You think they're going to win the pennant? <laughs> <laughs> no, Eric's a great guy, and so is Crisis Magazine, uh, but. You know, uh, do you love the Federal Reserve? With all my heart. See, now you're a good citizen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you should love the dollar so much, you don't want it to be backed by anything. You know, if you're like a banker or something, you know, basically, like the Fed chairman is like your pope, isn't it? Like if, if, you're, if no. you go to school as an economist, like that's... 
that's it right there. It doesn't get better. I mean, you remember the you remember the long time ahead of the Fed. Oh, I can't think of his name now, but he was ahead of the Fed up until two thousand eight. When Bernanke? Something happened. Oh, Greenspan. Yes. Yeah. He remember he was like the oracle at Delphi for yeah. years. People yeah. thought anything comes out of Martin Greenspan's mouth, it's it's gospel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was always cited as an expert on on everything. I mean, I, I remember when he and I were judging a beauty contest, uh, you know, and he got he got the job judging this contest simply because his word was law. That's amazing. I, mean, I thought so. Why I was a judge, I'll never know, but there it is. It wasn't a particularly uh, elevated beauty contest either. Don't you? It was Miss Tobacco. Miss Tobacco? Yeah, Miss Tobacco. That's kind of weird, no? Well, actually, what was weirder with the, were what the contestants were named, because they all won their, their respective things. So there was Miss Cigarette Tobacco. Miss Pipe Tobacco, Miss Cigar Tobacco, Miss Chewing Tobacco. She was uh, from Texas. Yeah. Miss Cigarette Tobacco had kind of a, a dry, leathery complexion. And Miss okay. Pipe Tobacco had a corn cob uh, pipe. Yeah. What? You know, you're getting that look of disbelief. I recognize that from your childhood. You remember, I would tell you stories, and all of a sudden, everything would be going fine. And then I'd, I'd reach a certain point in the story, and you'd look at me as though I were nuts. Do you remember that? Yeah, well, that yeah. I mean, that's basically what happened. It was a normal story, and then at some point, as you're going through all the different misses, uh, <laughs> you <laughs> 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 Ha! I missed you, you back up. <laughs> Beauty contests to avoid. <laughs> oh, uh, anyway, what do you think? You think all beauty contests are worth seeing? You think you really think that? All right. How, you, how about Miss Pegleg? You wouldn't want to see that, would you? No, I wouldn't. I didn't think so. Okay. Miss Leprosy. <sighs> okay. There are, a lot of these, there are a lot of these beauty contests I would skip if I were you. Yes. I I intend to. Good. I'm not yeah, I'm not really big on the beauty contest scene, so um, <laughs> me neither. All right. <laughs> my my foiled attempts to be a contestant. They scarred me for life. I I really I I never even made it to the uh, the Mr uh, Mr Accountant Awards. Okay, sorry. I, I was writing that down. I feel like I feel I feel like we hit the name of the show. You need got this to avoid. <laughs> uh, no, I I feel like Miss Tobacco Beauty Contest. I don't know. Oh, uh, so. There she is, Miss Tobacco. See her puff. <laughs> Bert Parks, the should be living. You, you know what? You know what? I feel like you're, especially like I'm getting inside your mind right now, and what what I sense inside your mind is the Mad TV skit with <laughs> the girl. I that remember that woman at the bar. Um... Oh yeah, I forgot about her. Yes, Mrs. Peroni. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> I, oh, it was, she wasn't in my mind, but thanks for bringing her back. Oh, okay. There you go. Oh, that, <laughs> she was wonderful. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. I had three husbands. The, uh, they all died. They all died of lung cancer. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my heavens. All right. Well. All right. All right. Well, it's perfect time to go into the memes of production. Nationalize the memes of production. For the common good. All right. Um, we actually have three proper memes, I think. Um, we were going to do them last week, but uh, we didn't have the time. So we'll just go into them this week. So, oh. John, first one is from John. 
This is a 19. Let's see. What do we got here? Uh, the girl, the, the girlfriend said, babe, please stop. You're not a 1940s L.A. private investigator. He says, beat it, toots. These streets aren't what they used to be. <laughs> this is so you. It's incredible. It's so true. They're not what they used to be. <laughs> what does she mean? I'm not a, a 1940s gumshoe in a city that knows how to keep its secrets. <laughs> <sighs> That's what comes to being indigenous. All right. Uh, next one uh, is from uh, a patron with the moniker St. Aldrich. Um, so he's, uh, well, we have a picture of a ballroom, the executive floor. We've got a bunch of pictures here. We can't quite see what's going on. But zooming into one picture, Tumblr House, uh, July the 4th ball, 1921. And there you are, Charles. And he says, you've always been the caretaker. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I've, I've always been here or there, I should say. <laughs> it's true. Um, Go on. That's good. All right. Uh, last meme is from a superfan curmudgeon. What is this one? Oh, that's right. You have Vince prepared for the show. Prim and proper, looking great, pretty spiffy. And then Charles prepared for the show, just getting ready to ambush. <laughs> just, just being wild. What? Uh, well, ambush? <laughs> what, uh, what? That's hurtful. You know what? You know what that is. You know what we call that? What? We call that a hate fact. Oh, so it is a fact. Wow. Yeah, it's, so it's you literally didn't even deny it. It just <laughs> I don't have to. It's a hate fact. Even bringing it up is wrong. It doesn't matter that it's true. It's wrong. It's a hate fact. I have to use that more. I really need to just like like digest that and, and be able to spew that whenever I need to. It's true. Oh, that's so good. Hate fact. A hate um, fact. All right, here we go. Um, we are down to the nitty gritty. There, there are only like four states of, of the week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, was, and there'll be three after the next uh, yeah. five minutes or so. Yeah, God. yeah. This state of the week is Virginia. Oh my, Virginia is for lovers. I love Virginia. Carry me back to old Virginia. That's what this old writer is hard and long to go. There's where I labored so long in the springtime, working every day in the fields of yellow corn. No place on earth do I love more sincerely than old Virginia, the state where I was born. Although I wasn't born there. No, I love Virginia. I really, really do. And it turns out I have some ancestry from there, so I don't have a choice. I have to love it. So if I were going to explore Virginia, how would I do it? I'm glad you asked that question. I would go, I would start in D.C. and leap across the border, across the, the fabulous Potomac, into Virginia. And the first thing I would see would be Arlington National Cemetery, which is well worth seeing, including the uh, Blair House. I would, um, there's so much to see in Virginia, so I've got to, I've got to sort of set myself out. To, I'm looking at the map in my head. Uh also in Arlington, is the George Washington National Masonic Memorial. Go see it, ladies and gentlemen. You bet. It'll give you an insight into the founding of our country you wouldn't have otherwise. But once you're done with fabulous Arlington, you can slip south and go to Alexandria, Virginia, see the old town. Uh, there are a couple of old churches and old uh, taverns and so forth, very colonial, really lovely. Um, going, uh, going further south, uh, you come to, eventually you'll come to, well, there, there are a whole bunch, of course, of Civil War battlefields, uh, the, the, the Wilderness Spotsylvania Courthouse, there's a whole chain of them ending up in Appomattox Courthouse, all worth seeing, um, as you go further down south, of course, you, you'll see you come to uh, Richmond. And I, I love Richmond. I really do. The cathedral is beautiful. 
the, uh, the White House, the Confederacy, uh, Battle Abbey. It's now part of the Virginia Historical Society. It's only a small section of it, but it's worth seeing. Monument Avenue has been somewhat desecrated since the hot, hot summer of burning love. And the moronic attack on, uh, on uh, uh, Confederate uh, monuments. But go see the Daughters of the Confederacy headquarters there in, uh, in Richmond. The, uh, the, state, the Richmond State House, the first of the capital of the Confederacy. Uh, you want to see the Edgar Allan Poe Museum while you're in Richmond, and you want to see the uh, uh, St. Paul's and St. John's Episcopal churches, uh, one having to do with Patrick Henry and all that, and the other with Jefferson Davis, although I believe they've taken out all references to Davis and Lee from those places, because, of course, they never happened. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of a cultural revolution in this country, like the Chinese. And if you find yourself in a position to oppose it in any given place, oppose it. These stupid, stupid munchkins. Anyway, uh, you could, there are a lot of uh, plantations along the James River. But you will find eventually, and see as many of them as you can, but you'll find yourself eventually in Williamsburg. Colonial Williamsburg. Oh, you know what? I forgot to mention uh, Mount Vernon. So be sure to see Mount Vernon when you go south of Washington. I'm on Google Maps right now. Where is that in the state? What part of the state? Mount Vernon. It's uh, due south of D.C., but uh, toward the river. Okay. Mount Vernon. It's George Washington's home and burial place and well worth seeing. And his birthplace is somewhere in the area. And Jefferson Davis's older homes at Shadwell and Tucko. Not Jefferson Davis, sorry, Thomas Jefferson. Um, then you want to go to, uh, you want to go, as I say, to Colonial Williamsburg and see the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's really an incredible place. The Governor's uh, Palace, uh, Bruton Parish Church, William and Mary College, especially the Wren Building. Uh, just enjoy Williamsburg. Uh, you'll also want to go to Yorktown, and you'll see a lot about the last battle of our first Civil War. Uh, and Jamestown, which was founded in 1607, the beginning of Anglo-America, although we know now there were Catholics there. And amongst other things, you'll see the Jamestown Memorial Church, which was uh, also the first law court and the first legislator, legislature it's rebuilt, but they all took place there. So it's very much the birthplace of Anglo-America. Um, going back toward Richmond, south of Richmond, there's Petersburg and Fredericksburg, which were both the site of Civil War and stuff, and really, really worth seeing. Uh, Norfolk has the, I think, Grace Church, it's called, uh, the Episcopal Church, still has a cannonball from the Revolution in it. Uh, and the Douglas MacArthur Museum, which you should definitely see in Norfolk, Virginia. And then uh, going east, there's Charlottesville, uh, which is really, uh, really a, a lovely town. Uh, the Mishi Tavern, which is a colonial tavern worth seeing. Uh, the Boys Head Inn, which is part of the University of Virginia, you can see the rotunda that was designed by uh, Thomas Jefferson. And very close is Monticello or Monticello, Jefferson's home. Also worth seeing. Scattered around uh, around the general area are James Madison's home and uh, James Monroe's uh, home. Lastly but not leastly, Going southwest from Charlottesville, you'll come into the Shenandoah Valley and eventually to a beautiful little town called Lexington. And Lexington uh, has VMI, the Virginia Military Institute, and it also uh, has Washington and Lee University, University with the uh, College Chapel and the tomb of Robert E. Lee, uh, which used to be festooned with Confederate battle flags which have been removed out of deference to uh, modern sensibilities. Weenie, basically, weenieism. Uh, 
Mm. And you'll see weenieism everywhere, uh, I'm afraid, as you travel through Virginia. Um, and you'll see resistance to weenieism as well. Hmm. So join the resistance. Don't be a weenie. And anytime you feel yourself going, I don't know, I'm just me, me, don't. Remember, the first weenie you need to deal with is your inner weenie. Wow. All right. Thanks for that tip, Charles. Uh, did I did I mention I love the Commonwealth of Virginia? Well, so how many Commonwealth? So there's like Virginia, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. Yep, you have one more. It was not one. It's the New only Hampshire. One, no, it's the only one of the four Commonwealths that was not one of the original thirteen colonies. Like Jamestown or something? What? No, Jamestown is in Virginia. I said it was not one of the original oh. 13 colonies. I have no idea. I'll give you a hint. A native of that state became world famous for his fried chicken. Can, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Yep. Wow. Commonwealth of Kentucky. Interesting. Okay. It was, it was part of Virginia, which is why they grabbed the name uh, Commonwealth. Hmm. But when West Virginia seceded uh, during the Second Civil War, they didn't want to be reminded of where they had come from, so they didn't call themselves the Commonwealth. Is there any uh, functional distinction there? No? Okay. None. None, just that they're very proud of being who and what they are. A, uh, a continually diminishing quantity in the United States. But I reiterate, I love all 50 of our United States. I think the United States are one of the greatest countries in the world, and not just because it's where I come from. Hmm. All right. I'm actually getting excited. There's three State of the Weeks left, and they are... Oh, man, it's going to be so good. All right. Um, all right. Uh, time for the questions. All right. Let's do it to it. Wow, we're actually on schedule. This is strange. I don't know. We haven't even reached the 30-minute mark, and uh, here we go. Um, well, the, the reason for that is because I'm at a monastery right now, and I've absorbed the rhythms and the regularity of monastic life. <laughs> <laughs> you seem somewhat unimpressed by this revelation. It just reminds me, sometimes I'm eccentric with my wife, and I'll put on airs, like, oh, I'm just how holy I am or something. Yes, exactly. And it, and it just, you just reminded me of me with that. I reminded you of you. Uh, this is a first. I feel the, very good. It, I feel that good is about a first. myself. That is a first. I feel good first. about myself. That's, 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 that's great. Okay, so you've you've absorbed all of their their energies and... Yeah. Their ways. Okay, the modalities, great. The, the, the modalities, their methods, <laughs> the, the, the old rhythms, you know, the old melodies, the, the age-old methods and means and mores. By the way, if, if they have that doc, I, the documentary I saw on EWTN, I don't know if they're selling a CD of that, but I highly recommend watching the documentary. It's really inspiring because it goes into their way of life. In in depth, there's so much praying. Everything's so structured. Oh yeah. Um, but also, obviously, they don't simply just pray too. They're doing a lot of interesting uh, projects and things like that. Because uh, I I think you said it. Um, somebody said it. Uh, where uh, they discovered once upon a time in monasteries that you can't just simply pray all day because then no. you go crazy. Well, that's why uh, Saint Benedict said, "Ora et labora." Uh, prayer and work. Yeah. So, all right, here we go. A uh, bunch of questions from super, flan, super fan Don from Florida, a fellow Paisan. Um, so he says, please discuss the life of King Sigismund, Holy Roman Emperor, his reign and influence on Europe and the Catholic Church. In Charles's estimation, where does he rank amongst all-time Holy Roman emperors? Ooh. 
The Emperor Sigismund was in the early 1400s. I can't give you exact dates off uh, out of my head, but I can tell you that he was in the House of Luxembourg and he played an important role, an essential role in the history of the church and Europe because it was he who put an end to the great schism. Nobody else could do it, just like no one else could put an end to the pornocracy in uh, going on in the 900s, but the Holy Roman Emperor out of the great. And no one was able to convene the Council of Trent out of all the chaos that was going on at the time of the Protestant Revolt, except Charles V. So too, no one was able to end the great schism except Sigismund. And he basically got tired of it. I mean, he'd had enough. They'd gone on for decades of uh, two and then three popes. And it was obvious that the ecclesiastical authorities were incapable of solving the issue on their own. When they tried to, when a group of cardinals from both sides got together to try to end it, they ended up electing a pope who became the third claimant because the, the popes in Rome and Avignon wouldn't accept him. And they certainly wouldn't step down. So that was kind of the catalyst, is the third pope? Yeah. I mean, you know, finita la commedia, as uh, our Italian forebears would say. Hmm. Those of us who are Italian know what I'm talking about. But the, uh, so the emperor said, all right, we're going to cut the comedy. Yeah. And he gathered a group of, uh, he could vote to Council of Constance, uh, invoking the memory of Constantine and Theodosius and so forth. And then... Uh, and then basically ordered the uh, ordered the three popes to resign. Hmm. Two of them did, one refused. But he ended up being abandoned by almost all of his supporters and dwelt to the end of his days sort of as a shadow pope in a little castle in Spain on the Valencian coast. But the rest of them uh, then gathered, and in 1415 elected Martin V as Pope. And that was the end of the great schism. So, you know, were, were there any qualities that Sigismund had that put him in a unique position to be able to do that? For example, uh, just just like as one example, um, I don't know, uh, six years ago or maybe even longer, time flies, but um, when Hunipro Serra was canonized, I feel like you made the point where um, Pope Francis, you know, given his qualities, he was able to do that and not have any bloodshed in a way where if Pope Benedict did it, that it wasn't going to go well. No, no. And I, I'm sure if, if we had a, a uh, an openly LGBT pope in rainbow, he yeah. could canonize anybody he wanted. Sure. And uh, the, the, uh, the press would uh, close their little mouths and keep yeah. them shut. Well, remember that the Holy Roman Emperor, in theory, was the highest sovereign in all of Christendom, and in a sense, the highest lay voice, just as the Pope is the highest clerical voice. And remember that church and state were seen as distinct facets of the same thing, the same Christendom. Uh, and basically, the laity of, of uh, Christendom saw in Empress Sigismund their spokesman in a, in, a, in a struggle that, while on the one hand it was causing them extreme damage, they had no voice. Is that, uh, I mean, imagine, if you will, a setup where the clerical leadership were doing whatever they wanted to and really didn't care what happened to the laity. Can you imagine such a situation? I know it's hard, but... Pretend for a minute that you had a clerical leadership so far removed from reality. They just didn't give a damn what their little actions and so on were doing to their flock. They just couldn't care less. Just couldn't care. And they just, you know, dancing around, prancing around, having their little schisms and their little excitements. And the lay people are, end up stuck with the results of it, to say nothing of having to pay for it. And then... Along comes a leading layman who has an army and is able to enforce what he says 
and yet is completely believing. Mm. And he says, all right, my dear reverend sirs, we're ending the comedy now. So what is behind his force? What is the threat that gets everyone to move? Well, he has an army. <laughs> and, but yeah, okay, well, what does that mean, right? Like, What it means is that if you don't do as you're told, bad things will happen. You know, what bad things? You might find yourself in a small room and not, and not, in free, not freely able to go about sp- Wouldn't ha- that be terrible? Has that ever happened like that? Where Of course it has. The Holy Roman Emperor gets his army and then like starts... Otto the Great. Went down to Rome and ended the pornocracy. So he locked cardinals up and stuff? Mm-hmm. And then they had a sort of change. Or they got their minds right. You know, they suddenly understood. <laughs> they, 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 they finally figured it out. They woke up and smelled the coffee. You know, they, they, they understood <laughs> there was something going on. It's, that's funny how a little prison time can do that. <laughs> it's amazing well it got him close to god you know it gave him time to pray that they hadn't had before wow okay you might say it gave him sort of a monastic cell <laughs> kind of a forced retreat okay so okay so i that's the biggest obviously that's the most substantial part of sigismund's um you know, it, it, was, it, was the, it was the threat. That was the most uh, most amazing thing he did. That was the biggest thing. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of other things he wanted to do that he didn't accomplish. But that, that was the single greatest accomplishment. And mind you, I'm not uh, you know, advocating violence against wayward clerics. But the fact remains that there are times in the church's history where the leadership becomes so oblivious that their own actions lead to things that are really shouldn't happen. I mean, another example of this is the sack of Rome in 1527. Now, on the one hand, that was a terrible thing. It shouldn't have happened. But on the other hand, it certainly did galvanize the College of Cardinals and the Pope. And I, I think that without the sack of Rome, they would not have taken the Protestant threat seriously. And I doubt they would have gone along with the Council of Trent. But the sack of Rome, you know, again, forced them to wake up and smell the coffee. What was the context of the sack of Rome? Well, what happened was that Charles V, who 20 years later would call Trent, uh, got into a fight with Pope Clement VII. So he sent his army to take Rome, which they did. Unfortunately, a lot of them were Lutherans. And they got out of control. They just they went on the rampage. They started looting and, and pillaging and killing and torturing. They were horrible, absolutely horrible. Uh, but the ultimate result was the uh, was the realization on the part of uh, the Roman hierarchy that uh, yeah something has to be done about this whole thing. The Protestant revolt is not just something going on in far off countries that we don't have to care about it. That's interesting how, yeah, so that's a good example of, dare I say it's reminiscent of the, um, the insurrection. (laughs) No, it's not. No, it's not. No, No. I mean, but, but in a way where it's like, it's like, right. No, I know. But just the disconnect in terms of like there's a disconnect where it's like yeah oh they're they're rioting in Be- in Los Angeles okay that's fine well, so it's mostly what? peaceful yeah. but then yeah. the tiniest thing happens oh. over there oh so bad for them just yeah. inconvenienced you know Nancy Pelosi you have to leave her often it was bad poor Nancy I feel so bad for her yeah all right okay. You heard, you heard you heard what uh, she and Hillary got into a big fight in the uh, congressional parking lot. No, I didn't hear that one. What happened? Well, it turns out there's only one space for a broom. Who won? 
<laughs> Hillary. <laughs> she was Sinatrix. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Um, please discuss the history of the Spanish road and its effect on the expansion of the Kingdom of Spain. Well, the Spanish road was basically the, the route from uh, the Italian ports that Spain controlled uh, all the way up to uh, all the way up to the Spanish Netherlands and Burgundy. Uh, and it played a big role. I mean, it's what allowed the Spanish to um, send troops and so forth uh, to fight the Dutch insurrection and later to uh, join in on the first parts of the uh, uh, Thirty Years' War and the War of Spanish Succession. Uh, so it's, it's, it, 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 the Spanish road made Spain a player. In the uh, in the affairs of Central Europe and of Italy, which it would not have been otherwise. Hmm. Okay, uh, what are Charles's thoughts on the periods of history led by leaders in diplomacy, philosophy, and theology from the Greek and Latin cultures—French, Italians, Greeks, Spanish, and Portuguese—versus that of the English and Germanic cultures? Great Britain, Germany, Dutch, Nordic peoples. Uh, which culture led to a more flourishing Catholic society? Oh, now that's... Uh, Toe the line, Charles. Toe the line. I sure will. It's always the Latins. <laughs> Latins rule. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not saying that because I'm Franco-Italian. I am not animated by ethnic uh, animosity here. I've got I've got Anglo and German blood myself. You know, I, I'm not pure Latin. I'm a half breed. You know, I'm indigenous. The, uh, we got that out of the way. But no, I would say that uh, prior to the Protestant revolt, there really wasn't all that much difference from the time of Christianization until the Protestant revolt. But after that time, there was a wide divergence. And yet, it wasn't that great. I mean, the policies of the Habsburgs, although uh, the Austrian Habsburgs became very Germanic indeed, was nevertheless, the whole me me uh, way of doing things was much more Latin than it was what we consider Germanic. And the same is true of places like uh, Bavaria and uh, the Rhineland. So I, I think the differences actually were more on account of religion and so of culture than they were of ethnicity. Hmm. So I'm, I'm just going to say whatever comes to the top of my head on this topic. Um, I'm sorry if it offends people. So, it means rule? You know, there's a lot of, you know, in terms of famous cathedrals, famous architecture, you've got a lot obviously in Latin, <laughs> obviously in Italy and France, this dominates. Um, there's a bunch in, in England, for sure. But they're um, all pre-Reformation. Pre-Reformation. No, but what I was going to get at is what about in, like, Northern Europe? Or, or is there that same... Like, yeah, it's like England. Okay. I mean, in the sense that you see, you see this wonderful spate of creativity up until the Protestant Revolt. Yeah. And then, not so much. I mean, it's not completely gone. There are a lot. They did a lot of interesting things, but not not with the same sort of genius uh, that you had in Latin countries. But uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, Sir Christopher Wren, uh, who was really the the big man of English Baroque. Uh, he did a lot of tremendous stuff. I don't think it's as great as the Baroque you'll find in Central Europe, but it's it's pretty good. Hmm. Uh, the or or in Latin America for that matter, you know, Latin American Baroque, uh, Spanish Baroque is just mind-boggling. Uh, of course, I, I have to admit 
my dirty little secret. I also love Rococo. Yeah, Rococo train stations. I know. So yeah. hey, random question, idea. Su- super random question. What's the prettiest? Um, I don't know, basilica or cathedral in Latin America. Oh wow, that is so so hard. I, I don't know any. Like well, I haven't really of... investigated. Yeah, I know. I figure there's tons of them. Well, I I would say my three favorites are Lima, Peru. Okay. Uh, oh gosh, there's this place in Brazil. Goiás, I think it's called. G O I A S. Uh, the Cathedral of Goiás, I think. Uh, the Primava, which is the oldest cathedral on the continent, Santo Domingo. Hmm. And the Cathedral of Mexico City is is pretty wild. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, to take it back to the question, so. What you're saying is, in terms of the differences in culture as we um, experience them now in Europe, is basically due to the differences that happened uh, post Reformation. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah. The, uh, the pre Reformation, I mean, obviously they all had the differences then, but they had much more in common with each other than, than they did afterwards. I mean, you think about somebody like uh, St. Anselm, who starts out as an abbot in Italy. Uh, he becomes, as a monk in Italy, he becomes an abbot of a French abbey and dies as Archbishop of Canterbury. That was not uncommon in Europe. You had so much crossover in uh, terms of, of uh, the arts and scholarship, the church. Uh, you know... Uh, St. Albertus Magnus, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, they, they taught in Paris, they taught in their, their homelands. It was not unknown for a scholar to go during the course of his career from Oxford to Paris to Bologna. Mm. And you could do that because everybody, all the educated people spoke Latin. Mm. So you could do all of these sorts of lateral transfers, but that's more than just people. It's also ideas and techniques and methods. And the same was also true with guilds. I mean, the, the cobblers' guilds in Spain were in touch with those in France and England and Scotland and so forth. Uh, so you, you had a lot of the religious orders also. You had, you had so much interconnection from one end of Europe to the other. Uh, and that was lost after the Reformation. All right. What about um, we? I kind of ignored one aspect of this, which is um, any differences uh, or approach to uh, philosophy and theology between Greek and Latin cultures and English and Germanic cultures, or not really. I think the, the creed you accept determines everything else. Um, I mean, and again. You had, you, you had various schools of philosophy in the Catholic world, but they all had adherents in each country. Hmm. Uh, mutatis mutatis, uh, it's like the fact that Zen or Chan Buddhism is found in China, Korea, and Japan. All, right. all three countries are Buddhist. Uh, and so you have schools that transcend nationality. All right. Um, all right. Uh, Don's final question. Uh, he says, I recently learned about the history of vestries in the Anglican patrimony. But what of lay ownership of church property in the history of the Catholic Church? Did it exist? If so, where was it most prevalent? Why did it fall out of practice? What are the pros and cons and consequences as a result of its practice being lost? Well, uh, it was very much a part of Catholicism. Uh, Royal patronage of abbeys and parishes and churches. The local nobleman uh, would often build the church, and so he had the right of presentation to it. Uh, That's where it, it 
came from in England was Catholic days. Uh, the uh, basically who, whoever or whatever, because sometimes it was institutions, guilds, and so on. Whoever or whatever endowed a church, built a church, usually had the right to appoint the pastor, subject to the approval of the bishop. That seems very weird and uncomfortable to me. There seems like a lot of, like due to the modern experience uh, that sort of I abide by, where it's like, okay, if you're going to, as a lay person, if you're going to very seriously participate in a church, you donate the money. You know, you don't actually own the church. You finance it. Well, you've got, you've got to bear in mind, A, that that's certainly the American experience, about yeah. which I'll touch on in a moment. Uh, but it's not been the church elsewhere, it's been the experience elsewhere. See, uh, don't forget, let's say you've got, uh, you've got a manor in the middle of the countryside, right? The lord of the manor builds the church, but he also supports it because his tenants don't have any money. They're peasants. It's everything they can do to come up with the uh, with the rent on their land, be it in co in cash or in coin. Now, it may be that they tithe, but even if they tithe, it isn't much. And so, the uh, it's it, at the end of the day, it falls to the Lord of the Manor to make sure the church is is kept in repair and so on. That's his responsibility, and that's why he has the the right of presentation to the church. And if he has a number of manners, well, poof, he had the, the right of presentation to a number of churches. There's a very funny story, which I'm sure I've told you, but this system got a renewal in uh, England after emancipation amongst Catholics. Because what happened is that during the, uh, uh, the penal times, basically the, the church hid in the private chapels of Catholic noblemen and gentry. But then 1829 comes along. They're completely legal again. And so what happened was that many of the local, the local uh, lord or squire, who's Catholic, would then build a parish church. Well, he didn't control it the way the Anglican might. But usually in return for his uh, having paid for it, he would have the front pew reserved for him and his family. So... The, the uh, to me, very funny story goes that in uh, the 1920s, this American tourist lady was in Norfolk in England, and she came to the uh, Catholic church that had been built in the 1820s, 100 years or so before, by the Bedingfeld family. So she sits in the front pew, and this little old lady comes up to her dressed in furs and, you know, a beautiful diamond necklace and all that. She says, pardon me, are you Lady Bedingfeld? And the American tourist lady says, uh, no, I'm not. She says, ah, well, you see, I am she, and this is her pew. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what an entrance. <laughs> <laughs> That's insane, where you're asking, are you this person, but this person ends up being me? Wow. Well, it's because that was Lady Bedingfeld's pew. What was she going to say? This is my pew. Get the hell out. <laughs> well, that would be the New York method. Yeah, sure um, would. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Are you, uh, are you uh, Don Colombo's uh, mall? <laughs> uh, no. Well, I is. Get the hell out. <laughs> See, now that's, that's warm up my alley. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought you'd feel better, that, better about that. Sure, I get it. I get it. Never you mind. Oh, man. Okay, so... Okay, oh, I get so, it. So in America... Yeah. Uh, remember that when the church started uh, in Florida, New Mexico, uh, Louisiana, um, it was all done under the French and Spanish royal patronage. And so it was the kings of France and Spain who appointed the, uh, or their governors, who appointed the respective parish priests. Anywhere from St. Uh, Louis Cathedral in New Orleans to uh, what became the Cathedral of Santa Fe, to the missions. 
you know, the uh, Father Sarah was appointed uh, head of the California missions by King Charles III, Carlos III, who also paid the bill for them. Uh. We, t- we tend to forget that. But in Anglo-America, what happened was that you would have these lay trustees who would fund the building of a Catholic church, and they would, um, they would own it, but the Bishop of Baltimore would send the would send the um, would send the priest. Now, occasionally this system led to problems, fights between either the the uh, lay trustees and the priest, or the lay trustees and the bishop, because sometimes the priest got into a fight with the bishop. But if he could get the backing of his lay trustees, the bishops could the bishop could jump. On the other hand. Uh, There's the famous case in St. Augustine, Florida, where uh, the priest was able to get Bishop Carroll or Bishop England, whoever it was then, to excommunicate the Board of Trustees because they have refused to allow him to bury someone from the church. And when he brought the body up to the church door for the funeral, the requiem, they slammed the door in his face and locked it. So he appealed to the bishop, the bishop excommunicated him. Now, what he left out of his account was that the man he had wanted to bury was a Freemason. And by canon law, could not get a requiem mass. Uh, but the priest had taken money from his family to violate canon law and do it anyway. I see. So you had a situation that was very spotty. So to replace it, what they did was they came up with the current system that you're used to, which is called corporation soul. Mm. And what that means is that the bishop is the owner of everything in the diocese. Mm. He owns everything directly. There you go. Now, this, of course, too has problems. There is no perfect solution. And this one certainly hasn't been. So that's why the bishop could order all the altar rails ripped out and all the tabernacles moved, and nobody could say boo about it because he owns it. That's why he can close parishes. But, by the same token, um, when various parishes got hit with all these uh, uh, abuse lawsuits, several dioceses tried to make the point, make the claim that the parishes were separate entities from the diocese, and that money taken from the diocese should not be taken from the parishes because they weren't part of the diocese and assets. But because of corporation soul, that idea was knocked down. And that's why several dioceses are on the, uh, on the uh, verge of uh, uh, bankruptcy. Then uh, a couple of other interesting elements you know, say the Church of St. Agnes in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is like a, a flagship of orthodoxy. It's not owned by the Diocese of St. Paul. It's owned by the Austrian National Committee. And that is why the late, great Monsignor Schuler was able to get away with all the stuff he got away with. Yeah, I mean, he had to stay a priest in good standing in the Archdiocese of St. Paul. But because he had the support of his lay board, he could uh, have a much more decent liturgy and uh, do a lot of good stuff that ordinarily he wouldn't have been able to do. Now, uh, an unfortunate modern example of this was in St. Louis, Missouri, when the, to my mind, great Cardinal Burke was archbishop. Uh, There was a Polish parish which had lay trustees, uh, and had had for 150 years. John Paul II had gone there when he was in St. Louis and so forth. But basically, Cardinal Burke ordered them to surrender control of the, of the property to the archdiocese. They refused to do it. He excommunicated them. They brought in some priest. Uh, and they've been happily running along in schism ever since. Uh much as I revere Cardinal Burke, I don't think that was the best of moves. I see. So, 
sounds like someone's got to control the property. Someone's got to own it. And unfortunately, there's no escaping fallen human nature, whether it's in lay ownership or by the bishop or someone else. No, there's a perfect plan. What would St. Thomas Aquinas say? He would say his dad uh, had the appointment of uh, scores of parishes throughout their part of Italy. It, that, I, I assume that's true. It is. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> okay. All right, I know you're in a rush. Um, one final question uh, to end the show uh, from Joseph, who I think Joseph's in Oklahoma too, and his family. Hi, guys. Uh, super fans. They go way back. Gosh. Uh, so um, he says, hello, Vincent and Charles. I recently had a guest who was a new friend over uh, oh, for supper, and he mentioned that the serfs of noble men were the equivalent of slaves. My guest gave me the impression, although I could be mistaken, that he regards all nobility to be slave owners and their subjects slaves. Although I am of the persuasion of monarchists, I'm very poorly equipped to be an apologist for monarchism. The best, uh, the best good I could do was state that I do not see how the Catholic social teaching on right to own land and the means of production conflict with Catholic theology of monarchy. How can I better explain that monarchy and nobility in general are compatible with the freedoms of common men as articulated in Catholic social teaching? Great question. Well, firstly, the, a, a bigger question would be not with the serf slaves, but are we slaves? And for that, uh, I would point out that the, uh, the average serf in the Middle Ages worked for 30 days a year for his lord. Uh, not all at once. They, they were broken up. Uh, we, of course, work, I think, something like 200 plus days a year to pay off our annual income tax. So the, to me, the immediate is always kind of an interesting question. Are we slaves? I don't know. I'm going to go put on my mask, hide in my, in my room, and, and think about it for a little while. But there are several things you have to bear in mind. One is, uh, unlike the slave, the serf had a lot of rights. He couldn't be thrown off his land, for starters. Uh, because he didn't, uh, he had an inalienable right to uh, the property he was on. Secondly, uh, he had a right to uh, quite a few days off a year, all the holy days of obligation plus Sundays. Uh, though there were a lot of holy days of obligation back then, and he got them all off. He didn't work for two weeks around Christmas, for one thing, and that was why the first Monday after the Epiphany was called Plow Monday because that was when he went back to work. The first Monday after the Epiphany. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> you know, you had oppressive lords, of course, unlike today where there are no oppressive governments and no oppressive taxation because they're so much better and smarter than they were. But uh, amongst the other rights that what I, I just when you said that I thought of the most impressive thing I could think of which was uh, Mayor Garcetti during COVID lockdowns and some people partying too much and him straight yeah. up turning off their lights and electricity I remember that what the hell is Ohio that? Garcetti mistress <laughs> of all she surveys uh, you know the, the, the garbage people took then <laughs> it's it's just, but you know, to be honest, that 4th of July, 2020. Well, we let it all hang out. Oh, man. That was when I was proud of L.A. <laughs> now, there were no LAPD helicopters in the air that night, I'll no. tell you what. No. They, they sent drones up and hoped for the best. <laughs> 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 but the... Uh, no, the, the, uh, the sad truth of the matter is that, uh, uh, you know, again, just as no human arrangement is perfect, certainly that of the serf and his master were not perfect. Uh, but during the high Middle Ages, uh, not to be confused with later on in Russia and elsewhere, um, they had a fairly equitable, uh, uh, equitable thing. 
And don't forget, too, that the common lands of every manor uh, were, it was a, the right of the peasant to graze his animals on them. That's why uh, after the Protestant revolt, when the lords, the English manor lords began enclosing the common lands, which had nominally been their property, but by custom were open for all of its tenants to use, that was their subtle way of driving the tenants out, off the land, similar to the highland clearances in the 19th century. Um, you couldn't do that in the Middle Ages. You know, and just to reiterate something that you said that really stuck with me, which if I was in the situation, I'd repeat it. It's um, the worldview of yeah. um, the priest, the knight, and the serf where, what is it? I, want, I The serf says, I feed all. Feed all. Yeah, you can do the, the rest. No, the, the, uh, you've got the three pictures of the, the priest, the knight, and the, uh, the peasant, the serf. And under the uh, priest... It says, I bless all. Under the night, I defend all. And under the, uh, under the surf, it says, I feed all. And those, those are the three estates. And they, they functioned as well or better than uh, most human societies. Um, we, of course, are perfect, so we, it's difficult for us. But uh, they weren't. And they accepted they, that they weren't. Now, the other thing that was interesting, too, is that if a peasant, especially, say, a younger son who wasn't going to get inherit the, the property. See, how do I put this? Just as uh, with the great lords, if their, uh, if their line failed, then their liege lord found a new vassal to take over. That's how the Habsburgs came to Austria. The House of Luxembourg, that had been the uh, the rulers of Austria at time out of mind, became extinct. Oh. So the Holy Roman Emperor, the land reverts to him momentarily, while he finds a new vassal to occupy it for him. And so he appointed Rudolf of Habsburg to be the uh, to be the new Lord of Austria, the new Duke of Austria. So the same thing was true for um, for the serfs. You've got a stretch of land that you've been farming. It's been in your family for a long time. When one of you dies, your son inherits, your oldest son inherits the tenantship. And it, it just keeps going. Yeah. But if you're a younger son, you've got nothing. Well, you can either try to work as a, uh, as a uh, laborer on, uh, on your brother's farm or somebody else's farm, or you can clear out entirely and try to escape. Now, let's say you do. You've, now, mind you, you're, you're the serf of a lord. You have an obligation to stay with him on his land. But you figure, you know, I'm not inheriting anything. I'm not getting anything. I, I'm clearing out a dodge. Well, you flee to a city. If you can stay in the city for a year and a day, your feudal obligation is dissolved. And that was the meaning of the old German adage, Stadtluft macht frei. City air makes free. But of course, then you'd be stuck with the problem of what do you do for a living? Because remember, you come to the city, you can't become a craftsman or an artisan unless you are a member of a guild. And you've got to go through apprenticeship and journeymanship to become a guild member. And those positions usually would go to the uh, children of, you guessed it, guild members. So you're not going to become a, a, a craftsman or an artisan. What will you do? Well, garbage jobs. And in such a way that you might have decided, considering what places the medieval cities were, you might figure that you kind of made a mistake. <laughs> But too late. It's a little bit like you see in the third world today, where many people flee the countryside and the poverty there, only to come to the cities and get stuck in a favela, uh, you know, uh, and be, be subjected to a whole new kind of poverty. Mm. 
Or similarly, so many people left the new left Europe to come to America to better themselves, and very often what they found was something worse than what they left behind. I mean, I'm going to be honest. In in this context, it sounds like there's more mobility in our society. There is more mobility, but then again, the question is, where do you go? Where do you end up? Now, there was another way out, however. If you had, uh, if you were a, a serf kid, a peasant kid, and you demonstrated to your parish priest that you had some ability with reading, writing, and arithmetic, that was another way. You might end up going to the church, or you might end up going to the university. And that's why most of the leading scholars of the Middle Ages came from peasant backgrounds. Interesting. Uh, there were other ways, too. I mean, you might become a soldier. You know, they had bands of mercenaries at different times, and a lot of them would be ex-peasants. Where does that get you, though? Well, if you survive, uh, if you manage, if you manage to survive, you end up with a bit of money at the end of the at the end of the day, and then you could buy some land somewhere. I see. Okay, so enough to, enough to buy land. Okay. Oh. Okay. And, and bear in mind too that this was not a rigid, uniform system from Portugal to Russia. There were all sorts of variations. Hmm. And but even stuck on the farm. You you only worked thirty days a year for your lord on his land. Uh, you work a lot more than that for your federal government today. Right. What would you say as a a modern businessman and taxpayer, if you only had to work thirty days? Uh, think of your income. Imagine that thirty days income would pay off your income tax for the year. 30 days? I don't know how many work days are in a year, um, but obviously, I don't, because I, I don't know how many days would equal 30% of our total well, can, work days we, in the year, you know? Can, we can figure this out. There are 365 days. There are 52 weeks. But 300... What's many? 52 times 5? Sorry, I use Google. 260 work days. So 260 times 30% equals, so 78 days. 78 days. And, and if you're taxed at 30%, which we're actually taxed more if you include sales tax, property tax, all this other stuff. So, I mean, that's fair. So we're more than doubled based on a 30% tax rate. Okay, for sure. So the math adds up, Charles. Well done. I didn't say I was stupid. <laughs> Despite all appearances to the contrary. So, well, you, well, math is not your forte. No, it's admittedly, not. So I neither, wanted to... neither are economics. There you go. But there are a few things I do know, and that's one of them. Yeah. So we work over double the amount of time for our lords that the serf did for his. Yeah. Uh, and we don't get the days off from all labor that he got. That being the case, however, he was subject to all kinds of diseases and maladies that we don't have, but then so too were his lords. That's true. So I, uh, the, uh, the sad truth, too, is that if you have access to technology and medicine and so on, you live more comfortably than the greatest monarchs of the Middle Ages. Yeah. Which is maybe why we need safe spaces and, and get weenie. You know, that's why maybe that's why we're weenies. Could that be it? Do you think? Could be. I don't know. I feel so bad. It's so awful. That's a pout. All right. Um, all right. That's it. I'll, power. We're we're pout bad. power. Pouting power. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Well, any final thoughts before we oh, let you go and hang with the Habsburgs? I will say Thursday, the Feast of the Ascension. Ooh. You bet. And that means Pentecost is coming. And after Pentecost, Corpus Christi. And after Corpus Christi, the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And that means that the 
the uh, Paschal cycle will be over. Then we'll have to get through summer and the Sundays after Pentecost. Mm. And then autumn. Autumn. Did this, I say autumn? Does your mind really jump ahead on the seasons like that? Is it really truly? Is that is that where you're at? It only does when we when we're ready to hit summer. Interesting. If I could go from 30 May to 1 September, or in LA to uh, 15 October, I would. I don't know how your brain does that because my brain is literally the opposite, where it's like. Oh, summertime. And that's obviously based on memory because as you know, when you're in school, summertime is the time for fun stuff. It is. It's the only time you get out of school uh, is is the summer. But you want to jump it. I cuz I like cool weather. I don't <laughs> like heat. <sighs> I'm not into heat. I'm just, you know, you know the phrase he's hot stuff? Yeah. I'm not. I'm oh. not. I'm not hot stuff at all. Wow. I do like chilling. I like chilling a lot. Oh, chilling? I thought you said chili. That too. I, I do like chili, but yeah. I like chilling a whole lot. Yeah. I like to chill. You know? Yeah, just chilling. Yeah. That's what, they, that's, uh, what the, what the uh, Mastodon and the Ice said to uh, the Explorer. Right, yes. So the dinosaur would say that in the Ice to the Explorer, yes. They said just chilling. So, <laughs> all right, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, remember, Off the Menu is now being broadcast and podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. Um, but anyhow, so if it's I, Monday, it's Off the Menu. And the soul you save, don't help. Might be your own. See you next time, everyone. God bless you from Oklahoma.